Hello, I'm Manuel from Mountains and welcome to this Corey engine video. Today we're going to have a look at some of the new stuff that has made its way into the engine since version 7.0, uh, including 7.1 and 7.2. Um, not really a tutorial video today, but just uh, really more of a tour of the new features and I'll be explaining how to use them as we go. All right, so uh, the first thing I want to show you is in showcasing that scene, uh, Retro Mountains, and it's a new ability. So uh, if you've been using the engine for a while, you know there's a dash, it's directional, it's got tons of options, it's been there pretty much uh, from the start, but one of the things that people kept requesting was the ability to dash along a slope. So right now I'm dashing, you can see the, the start effect of the dash, but I'm hitting what the dash considers a wall, instantly so i stop at that slope and um i created a new ability for that uh it's called the roll ability so the dash dashes in the air the roll dashes along a slope so oh well, if i press both at once it's weird but just g for the roll and it will follow whatever slope you have and it comes with uh, a lot of options. So it's a separate ability. You've got character rule here and character dash must be over there. You can have both. Uh, that's, that's what I did earlier when I pressed F and G at once. Um, lots of options on the wall. You can change the duration. Uh, you can decide whether or not it should block input. So for example, I made it longer and I can reverse input as I'm running. Uh, but if I check that checkbox, of course, I can't change direction as I'm going anymore. Uh, change the roll speed. Uh, so you can have a very long roll at a very low speed. There we go. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you, can, you can also have limited rolls. If I know many times, you can roll. Uh, but yeah, just another ability to your long list of abilities that will let you create fun and unique characters. The next thing I want to show you is uh, another ability. And I'm in the minimal rooms demo scene right now. So it's a demo scene where you can navigate between uh, doors and you've got these two blue gates here. If you open one of them, you get to a new scene, minimal rooms two. And you can go back to rooms one and you can get into rooms two via another door. So uh, just to explain that this demo is linked to another one, I'm changing scenes. And basically by doing that, uh, it looks like I'm keeping the same character because the next level instantiates the same prefab, so they look the same. So uh, to the eyes of the player, well, of course, you know, you just, uh, it, it's the same character, but it's not. I, I just instantiated a brand new one every change that was made to uh, the character in the last scene has been lost. And that's the thing that's been requested a lot. You want your changes uh, that you may have applied to your character to persist. And that's where the new uh, character persistence ability comes in. So in that scene by default, um, and on that character, persistence is not enabled. So the first thing I wanna do is locate my prefab. I can uh, open my level manager's inspector and under player prefab, I can just click here. It's going to select for me in the project view, but uh, character is bound to this scene right now. It's going to be instantiated. And um, I can just add a character persistence. So I can, if I want to find it here, I just have the, the start of persistence and there we go. And I want to leave all of that by default. Doesn't really have any options. It's, it's on or it's off. And now if I press play here, you'll see that uh, I can just go through that door. I'm still inside rooms one. I go into that second door. I'm now in rooms two and not much has changed, right? It looks like the same, but if we look here, uh, we can see that our rectangle is now don't destroy and load. So that means it will uh, persist across scenes as it is. And you can see the system disables it, uh, enables it again at the right time to avoid it falling uh, through the abyss of your loading screen, for example. And the cool thing is 
any change I now make to any of these will persist as long as that character uh, exists. So for example, I'm going to change the run speed to 50 and you can see I'm now running considerably faster. I'm going to go through that blue gate. So loading, complete new scene. I'm still running extremely fast, maybe too fast, some would say. Uh, <laughs> I didn't plan on that. Um, and yeah, every, every change I would make uh, to these values would persist. Um, I guess I could, if I add a, let's say, a cactus to my scene. Yeah, in scene view, that would help. Where am I? And where is that cactus now? Cactus is here. All right. Ah, uh, Unity. All right, so I'm going to put a cactus over there. I'm going to get, yeah, uh, of course I pressed jump right into that gate. That wasn't very smart. Okay, I'm going to put myself here. I'm going to drop a cactus over there. Go back to game, start getting hit by the cactus a few times. All right, so you can see I've lost some health. I'm going to go through that gate. And you can see the health also survives. So any change you make to your character will persist. Character persistence uh, and new ability. All right, the, the next feature I want to show you, I'm going to demonstrate in that demo scene, Retrovania. So more and more people um, have been making Metroidvanias with the engine. So levels, uh, games really, where progression is non-linear and you have these massive levels, usually way bigger than that where maybe you want the player to go grab a key over there, then use it to open a door over there, then fight a boss over there to grab an item that is over there. And uh, so there's a lot of, of travel between rooms and you want the player to be able to respond at the correct point. And now the point is not just, uh, you know, the, the, the order of your checkpoints is not just a linear one dimensional axis uh, where, you know, if, if you've progressed on the X axis now, you're, you're further right, so you respond to the right, like you would in Mario. Now it's really anything that you want. So uh, that's one of the new things in 7.0. I have only one checkpoint right now in that demo. Uh, it's the level start, but we're going to create a few more together. So um, if you select your level manager, you'll see that we have a few more options that weren't there before. So uh, previously, you would be able to define the attribution axis of your checkpoints uh, to X, Y, and Z. Um, and the idea was that you would be able to put checkpoints on an axis and the order would be automatically decided by the system. Uh, checkpoints that were more to the left uh, would have a lower uh, priority than the ones to the right. So anytime you would reach a certain um, part of the level on, on the x-axis, that's that would be your, your last checkpoint. The think, think Mario. I think I made a poor explanation of it, but I, hopefully you get the idea. You, you start here, your level goes to the right. Anytime you pass a waypoint uh, checkpoint, you that's, that's your last one. Uh, you could cheat the system by having them on the z-axis, so uh, vi visually they would uh, still be on that plane, but uh, you could change the order on the z-axis. Now it's uh, more explicit with the option to have the checkpoint order. And I'm just going to demonstrate that. So I'm going to duplicate my uh, checkpoint, rename it checkpoint. Doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to make it bigger so I make sure I collide with it. I'm going to put one on the top of that uh, cliff here. And I'm going to put another one in that room over there. So we now have three uh, checkpoints. And you can see that when I select a checkpoint, I have a, uh, well, I, I, I can decide the facing direction. So that's where they respawn and how the character should be facing. Uh, but I have a, a checkpoint order. So by default, it's zero. So I'm going to make this one uh, checkpoint order one and this one checkpoint order two. So when I press play now, you're going to see uh, if you go back to scene view, you have a uh, gizmo. So the, the, the system is uh, hiding everything but the current room. But if you remember, we, we put one on a spike that was there, one in a room that is here. So we have our initial checkpoint value zero that goes to checkpoint one, that goes to checkpoint two. 
And what this does is that now if I uh, go back on the x-axis really, so uh, enter that checkpoint that was there. And if I put something, it was instant view, something next to me that could kill me like this. Okay. I die and I respawn at the last checkpoint, which isn't on the uh, usual x-axis. So that's cool, but I can do even uh, funnier things now where, for example, if I make a new uh, checkpoint and I put it, let's say I put it here. Um, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make that one. All right, so if I do this, so uh, this one over here has an order of zero, this one an order of one, this one an order of two, and this one an order of three. If I press play again, go here. So I'm entering this checkpoint. And now I'm going to go to that other one. I go to that other one. If I were to die right now, I would respawn at this checkpoint. Uh, and I can demonstrate that, I guess, by putting this guy over there. So I die, I respawn at the last checkpoint. If I visit this checkpoint and die, I will still respond here because that's the checkpoint with the highest checkpoint order that I visited. So I could go back all the way to uh, these checkpoints, visit them again. It wouldn't change the fact that my checkpoint right now is this checkpoint. But if I select another checkpoint and say force assignation, now every time I visit that checkpoint, it becomes the, the, the current checkpoint. So with the combination of the checkpoint order with the combination of auto, auto assignation and force assignation uh there's no limit really to the kind of games you can you can create uh it it's just i think all the options uh you need but if you need more options for your checkpoints uh don't hesitate to reach out uh there's a contact form you can use for suggestions i'd be happy to improve on the system even more all right, so the next thing I want to show you is in demo in that scene, Retro Forest. And you can see if I grab that gun and start shooting at stuff, look what happens when I shoot that crate in the middle. A coin appeared. And that is all thanks to the loot system. Uh, most of the things that you can destroy in that level are like that. You can see that guy also dropped the coin. And uh, let's have a look at how it's done. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go in uh, scene view and I'm going to select my crates. I'm going to leave the second one, retro crate 2. I'm also going to disable enemies uh, in a previous uh, attempt at recording this. They kept attacking me while I was working. Uh, we can't have that. So uh, this crate you can see has a sprite renderer, box collider health. That's classic. And we also have this loot script, um, which will let us spawn stuff basically it's a it's a spawner um and in this case it's also a spawner based on a loot table so we're going to have a look at that one thing to keep in mind um in most cases and that's what it was designed for initially uh it's used to spawn i don't know bonuses and coins uh weapons whatever when you kill something i uh, think diablo uh for example but it's really a an agnostic class now and it can do anything. Uh, so you could use it to spawn different VFX on death. For example, you want the small, the big, the random explosion. You could use that system for that. Uh, so there's no limit to what you can do with it. But it's still called cool loot. Um, so let's have a look at the inspector here. Uh, the first thing uh, you'll notice is we have to define a loot mode. We have three of them, unique, in which case we would be spawning a single object loot table in which case we can define uh, a list of objects to loot on that prefab itself on that object or we have the loot table scriptable object which is the option uh, we've chosen here these two are pretty much the same they work the same way 
Uh, the only difference is that, uh, well, the scriptable object won't be tied to that particular object. You can assign it to many um, uh, objects in your scene, which lets you define one loot table for all of them, uh, or, or a few loot tables for all of them. If you uh, pick loot table, of course, that's going to be unique to that crate or its copies. Uh, well, not even its copies, you know, like they, they, they would, each object would have its own loot table. So let's have a look at the uh, scriptable object approach. Uh, you can see that here I have a loot table. It's got three elements, uh, a coin, a steam pack, and a one-up. And all of them, they have, they, they have weights. Uh, this one has a weight of 25, 3, and 1. And you can see that the system even computes uh, percentage uh, chances numbers uh, next to it. So the weights, they are on an abstract scale. Uh, they don't have to add up to anything. Uh, that's to avoid you having to do too many math. You, you can express them in any unit that you want. It's your convention. Um, here, I, I don't even know what I was going for, but uh, this clearly means that this has 25 more chances uh, than this to, to spawn, right? And this uh, has three times more chances than this to spawn. Um, you could decide on any scale that you want. It's up to you. Uh, of course, these are relative weights. And if you're uh, unsure of the result, well, the system computes uh, percentages. So, for example, if I were to change that for, I don't know, uh, 80, uh, 15, and 5, so I'm, I'm thinking in percentages. Uh, if I were to press play, which is when uh, this gets computed, you can see that uh, it applies the percentages like that. But if I were to think uh, 800, something like that, you can see it, it keeps the same uh, percentages. I'm not sure if that's the best way to demonstrate this. Um, something like that. You know, like any, any sort of scale you want to work with, uh, it's just going to work. And of course, it would be the same uh, if you had chosen loot table, but you would have to define it here, not there. Uh, then we have the conditions. So spawn loot on death and on damage, which are what I imagine will be the most common uses. Uh, but of course, if you want more, it's an API, it is public, it is documented. So uh, you can just, in the loot class, uh, which is the, the class we're using, um, you can see we have a spawn loot method. It's public, you can call it from anywhere. So if you want your loot to happen when your box has 50% of health, you could have a class manage that, call that public method for you. Um, then we have a delay after death, uh, after which the, the loot will happen. Uh, we have a quantity, uh, it's a min and max value. It's going to pick a random number between both of these. So uh, I set, uh, you know, 50 to 100. So yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, a lot of coins, some steam packs, and I think I got uh, a one up. Uh, then. Yeah, you have also a uh, maximum quantity. You can decide that it should, uh, whether or not it should avoid obstacles, uh, in which case it's going to try to spawn outside of a certain um, range and try to not spawn too much stuff inside platforms. Uh, you can uh, bind a feedback, an MM feedback, to uh, uh, the moment where it loops, and then we have our debug options. And, and the last thing is the spawn properties. So um, one of the cool things, and probably a bit overdone who needs that many options i don't know but it was fun to make um so now i have to show it to you uh is this thing so you can draw gizmos that's gonna and and, and they're gonna show you where uh things are gonna spawn or where things have a chance to spawn so uh you can increase the number of gizmos or decrease it uh, the more you have of course the more costly it is uh, in terms of performance on your editor you can change the color to suit uh, whatever landscape uh, background you have and now you can start customizing things so uh, what's really fun is there's a lot of options uh, for example you can use an animation curve in real time to uh, redefine the shape uh, of the zone weird uh, way to uh, weird way to to define a spawn zone, uh, I think, to have such a shape, but you could if you wanted to, which is the most important thing. Um, 
you can uh, define all sorts of offsets like this. You can uh, change the shape from sphere to cube. Uh, you can change the radius of the sphere between a min and a max because also it's it's uh, it's all randomized. So you can you can create all sorts of weird shapes. Uh, you can change the axis on which you are spawning things. And you can uh, remap everything to create all sorts of weird shapes. So this this you have to think of as like the the, the profile, the uh, side view of your spawn zone. So now everything that I would spawn would spawn within uh, within this. And that's pretty much it for the, uh, I, I guess we can try it. We'll get to try it. All right. And you can see that if I were to, ah, it won't draw the gizmos at runtime. Well, you know, that's more or less the shape we defined. So that's it for the loot system. Uh, very versatile, powerful, simple to handle, I think. Um, and hopefully you can, you can make something cool with it. For this uh, next thing I want to show you, I'm in the retro procedural um, demo scene. And a lot of people have been making games using the engine, uh, you know, published ones or upcoming ones using procedural generation. And I wanted to put a way in the engine to show how it's done. There are a billion ways to generate levels. Uh, it's not meant as a unique way. It's not meant as the way you should do things. It's an example of it. Um, you should be able to change that system for anything you prefer, uh, something bigger, something different, something uh, more clever. It's just showing that it can be done. Uh, and showing one way it can be done. But don't take that as like the gospel of uh, procedural generation. So in that demo, we have a uh, manager here called Time Map Level Generator. And what it does is it lets you, by pressing the Generate button, it lets you create new levels. And as you can see, every time it positions a level start, uh, it positions coins for us to pick an exit, and every time it's at places where it makes sense. Uh, so the uh, time map level generator has a lot of options. We're gonna go over them. Uh, another one it has is you can also have it generate on awake. And what this does, if you check it, what this does is, uh, well, you spawn into a level, then you reach the exit and it generates a new level and a new level and a new level and a new level every time, infinite fun for the whole family. So let's have a look at the options that we have, and there are quite a few. So uh, the first thing you have to know is the system is um, designed to generate grid values, zeros and ones on a grid. Uh, you could theoretically use these values to paint prefabs or do whatever. Um, this one uses uh, time maps to, it, it paints on time maps. So uh, again, just an example, there are plenty of ways to do procedural generation. Uh, this one uses time maps. So the first thing you can define is the size of your grid, uh, a random number between um, 10 and 30 for the width and 10 and 20 for the height, which gives us uh, something always between these values. Or I could change that to uh, something between 10 and 200 for the height, which of course would give me much bigger levels vertically. And of course, if you don't want uh, random values, but you always want 10 by 20, you can get always 10 by 20, uh, simply by, by putting the same value in min and max. Um, then we have the seed. So what the seed does is, uh, I'm going to go back to some random values so we get more different um, looking results 
All right. All right. So uh, let's say I like this one. I like this level, which has a sort of a square shape and a window in the top left, right? So I'm going to copy that seed and I'm going to generate a few more until I get something that looks uh, different. So let's say this one, right? Very rectangular. If I were to prevent the system from randomizing the seed every time I press generate, and if I paste the seed I uh, copied earlier, press generate, you can see I, I go back to, and I can do it over and over again, I will always go back to the exact same level. Same uh, position for the level start, the exit, the coins, and the platform. So th the system is um, deterministic. Every time you input the same seed, it outputs the same result. Uh, that's particularly useful if you're making, I don't know, a, a Metroidvania where every room is procedural, but you want players to be able to go back and keep a sense of space, right? So um, you can just recall whatever room you had using that, that int, that seed. Then you have uh, options to do a slow render. So I would strongly recommend you don't use it uh, because, because basically what it does, I can show you, uh, it doesn't work well within the Kogi engine, um, mostly because if you press generate, it, it draws the, it's gonna draw the, uh, the map in real time. Uh, it's fun to do videos to post on Twitter not really good uh, if you are spawning the character and there's no floor to hold it. Um, but if you, if you were to start something out of that system, that'd be an option to play with. Um, then we have the option to generate on awake. Uh, so every time you uh, enter the level automatically, a new level would be generated on awake. Then we have a bunch of bindings. So it's saying, hey, uh, you should paint on that grid here uh, so unity time up grid then we have uh the platform that the no, sorry the time map that should be considered a platform uh the layer mask on which to find obstacles in this case that's platforms and uh the level manager that we use right here um we also need to bind a level start for the system to play to place uh a spawn offset and exit uh, that's the uh, the sort of uh, Mario-like exit here. And you can define a minimum distance between the spawn and exit. Otherwise, because it's random, uh, it could well place both on top of each other. So you usually don't want that. And then you can add a number of objects to reposition. Um, again, this is like an example of procedural generation. It, it generates very limited uh, levels. It doesn't have enemies. It's really something, a base uh, that you should look at and expand upon, or simply create something completely different. But it just gives you an idea of, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, at, at that class, um, it's also going to show you, you know, you how how and when you should generate your stuff. You know, usually at a wake, and uh, it's a good reference, a good starting point if you're planning on generating stuff for sure. Um, the last part of it, I guess, would be this uh, layers section here. So what this does is it defines the different layers that the system should paint. And you can see I have four. And for each of them, um, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just going to play with uh, the first one with platforms. So you can see that this one targets the platforms time map, and it's going to use this rule tile, uh, in this case, retro ground. But I could make it any, um, any tile. That I want. So I changed it for the blue platform, and you can see that it's now painting uh, blue platforms. I want green platforms. I'm now painting with green platforms. I can uh, decide that I want to override the grid size. So um, uh, by default, you know, it adheres to uh, the grid that is defined at the top. But for each layer, you can say, hey, no, actually, I want it to be, well, I don't know, 50 by 50, right? Well, of course, 50 by 50 goes out of the screen, but uh, I don't know, 20 by 20. All right, so I, I could have the rest of the system stick to these rules, and I can have a layer override if I want. 
uh, not something I would recommend for maybe the, the main layer you're uh, supposed to, to work on, but for a background decoration, why not? Plus, uh, what's uh, my opinion worth in that? You know, it's, it's your level, it's your rules. You do whatever you prefer. And after that, we have a generate method. So uh, for each layer, you can use an algorithm. Uh, full, for example, will fill the entire uh, section. Perlin is going to random randomly uh, use a Perlin noise to, to fill what it can. Perlin ground is the same thing, but it tries to create a ground. You can see we, we're really looking just at the uh, green blocks here, right? Ignore the rest. So you can see that Perlin ground tries to do a walkable ground and uh, it's, it's trying. Uh, then we have random, which just randomly paints stuff. Um, oh, it's important to know, I, I have these bounds here that let me automatically, whatever the result of the generation, uh, it fills these lines and columns here on the sides. So if I uncheck it, uh, you can see that now I can have borderless uh, stuff sometimes. If I go back to Berlin, yeah, you know, like it's, it's completely random now. Um, then there's the random walk. So that uh, starts at a point sort of carves its way, uh, so you, you always get a, a, a continuous path. Random walk avoider, this one would let you avoid another time map. Random walk ground, same thing, it's a random walker, but it tries to get you a ground at the bottom. The path, this one sort of carves the path vertically or in the direction that you want, you know, bottom to top, left to right. And now you have a path left to right. And uh, copy. This one will copy another time map. So if I just do that, all I get is errors. Uh, but if I were to um, grab another, another time map, for example, one way platforms, it would copy. Another one, the issue here is that I'm also rewriting uh, that other time map as I do it, so it doesn't make sense in that context. So let's go back to maybe Perlin ground and add all my bounds on right. I can also define safe spots. Uh, so for example, I could say I want one safe spot and I want it to be uh, between these coordinates, maybe uh, 0, 0, and 3, 3. And so whatever I do, that's 0, 0, that's 3, 3. Uh, that, that section here would always be empty. So if I say uh, from 2, 2 to, uh, um, I don't know, 5, 6, I generate this sort of safe spot. I could be hiding an enemy in there, you know, I don't know, it's up to you. And the great thing is you can also uh, combine things. So for example, here I have this uh, first layer that, that does a pass from bottom to top. And that second layer also writes on the, the one-way platforms um, time app, but it's using a fusion mode here, combine. And you can see that I could have it intersect, I could have it uh, combine, subtract, and so on. So uh, maybe a good way to show it to you would be to just remove these. Oh boy, Unity, why are you like that? All right. So I just have my platforms now. I would, of course, have to clear the one-way platforms uh, first, or maybe simply disable it for the time being. All right, so I'm generating my, my ground here with my date zone. But if I want more options, uh, what I can do is simply um, select, add, add another layer, uh, say it also targets platforms. I want it to be active. And I want it to be a path, and I want it to go from left to right. 
and I want to uh, have a min width of maybe 10, a max width of 20. And I want it to start at 0, 2. And if I just do that, you can see I get that, I get that path, right? And it, it simply overrides whatever uh, I had done in the first layer. But if I, sorry, if I select a fusion mode here of combine, for example, uh, you can see that now I, I'm combining both. If I do intersect, it's only going to keep the intersection of both. If I do normal no clear, it uh, just adds to it. And I can also subtract, in which case I'm basically inverting the thing. I can also invert the grid, which gives me also, uh, it's sort of uh, all the zeros becomes ones, uh, all the zeros become one, and vice versa. And there's also options to smooth the result. So yeah, combining all of these, you will create very unique levels, uh, sometimes very non-functional levels like I just did. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I think, a good base, a good study base even to, to learn more about procedural generation and to build your own system upon. Um, again, plenty of ways to generate levels. This is just an example. And version uh, 7.0, the engine also introduced uh, the latest version of MM tools and MM feedbacks, uh, which are now also available in a package called Feel. So they used to be uh, part of a package called MM feedbacks, but that package contained more than MM feedbacks and it was confusing everyone. So now it's probably still a bit confusing, but I'll try to, to walk you through it. So uh, there's this package called Feel, it's on the asset store, and it contains MM feedbacks which you already have if you have the, the Corgi engine, MM tools, which you already have if you have the Corgi engine, and nice vibrations, which you don't have, and 20 demos, which you don't have. Uh, so the, uh, the, I, I get the question like multiple times a day uh, since the release of Phil, should I buy Phil if I own the Corgi engine? And it's a good question. Um, I don't think you should buy anything, you know, like it's, it's a, do whatever you want. But uh, just so you know, there's uh, a discount if you own the Corgi engine and you want to buy fuel, usually it's 40 bucks. If you own the Corgi engine, it's only 15, which is the price of nice vibrations uh, if you were to buy it separately. So again, you it's, it's got these four things in it, uh, MM feedbacks, MM tools, nice vibrations, 20 demos, uh, and more. Uh, if you own the Corgi engine, you've got these first two already. Uh, if you're interested in just these two, don't buy fuel. If you want the rest, then you know it's up to you. Uh, you will then be able to uh, easily import all of these into a new project and, and use them. Uh, no need to import fuel into the Corgi engine. Uh, well, sure, you would get the demos, but uh, these you already have. So uh, one last time, and uh, hopefully it will make it less confusing. If you already have the Corgi engine, you have these two. If you want these two, sure, you can buy fill or you could buy nice, nice vibrations on its own. Um, you will find you know, all the info about fill uh, here. You'll find uh, demos of all the MM feedbacks, but also more demos showing uh, all the good stuff that is in fill. I'm on a satellite connection right now, and it may take a few years for me to load this demo but while it loads you know like uh, there's more stuff uh all of that all the the feedbacks the mm feedbacks at least are also in the corgi engine uh, so you get all the latest versions of them uh every time there's a new update and if you're interested in mm feedbacks and all the mm tools helpers uh, there is also a documentation, uh, a new one, that yellow documentation. It contains everything you need to know. But feedbacks, there are uh, sort of like seven hours, I think, of tutorials, uh, video tutorials. They are all relevant to the Corgi engine as well. Uh, so uh, MM feedbacks and MM tools are built into the Corgi engine. Uh, pretty much every character ability. Every component uh, has a feedback hook, 
So if you're interested in adding more game feel, adding more juice to your game, uh, you can go and check that, feel-docs.moremountains.com. Uh, there's also an API documentation and pretty much, you know, everything you need to know about all of that. Um, I don't duplicate that, that documentation into the Corgi engines documentation uh, just because it would become very much uh, a headache to maintain for me. But yeah, if you're into uh, feedbacks, you'll find all the info you need over there. And yeah, more demos. Everything you see in these demos, you could uh, use in the Corgi engine as well. For example, all the progress bars in the Korg engine use that exact system, MM progress bar. This one is just uh, juiced to the max, but same system. And there are also uh, dedicated URP and HDRP demos in Phil uh, that are not in that WebGL export. Go ahead, check it out if you're into that sort of stuff. And again, uh, don't hesitate to check that documentation. Um, it really applies also to the core gauge. That's it for the new stuff in um, this new version. That's that's actually just a, a portion of the new stuff. So if you, if you want to see everything that's new uh, since 7.0, that's the list. Uh, you'll find it on the release page uh, of the Corgi Engine website. A lot of new stuff. Well, I showed you the most uh, significant ones, but you can see a lot of bug fixes. Um, by the way, uh, I got the question the other day, uh, why were there emojis on that page? And it's a good question. Uh, it's, it's like a convention uh, that I've seen at many places I've worked at and that, that I've started to enforce myself because I like it. Uh, so when you see sparkles, it's a new feature. When you see uh, racehorse, it's an improvement uh, in terms of performance. Rocket is like an improvement on an existing feature. Uh, the caterpillar is a bug. Lipstick is uh art or visuals or details uh you know like a, a typo in a comment um what else is there uh when it's a package thing it's it's really a, a, a logistic change uh you know we moved that folder to that folder stuff like that so uh yeah i i, <laughs> I hope it will explain what these emojis are i also think they look they look cool when you when you push a comment you're like hey it's a, it's a bug fix. It's got a tiny bug. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, version 7.0 of the Korg engine. I hope you learned something new today. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.